morning we are excited uh, to have Todd Aaron with us. Uh, Todd, his bio is in your sermon notes, so I'm not going to read that for you. But what you don't get in the sermon notes, you're about to get in person, and that's his heart and passion uh, for the command to go and make disciples, for the, the, the mission that, the, that God has sent the church on. Uh, he brings with him a Holy Spirit energy that I think probably should come with a warning label because it is very contagious, and it may rub off on you. And after this morning, it's going to just be fun to see what God uh, may be calling you to do. So would you join me in welcoming uh, Todd Aaron this morning? Good morning. Uh, when I became a Christ follower, I thought that uh, God wanted to bless me. I didn't know he wanted to change me. And uh, for me, like many of us, when I started to read the Bible, I would ask the question, where am I? If I felt bad, I'd read Psalms. If I felt really bad, I'd read Job. But for the most part, I was just kind of looking and asking the question, where am I, where am I, where am I? Uh, a friend of mine invited me to a Bible study, and I thought, this is great. It's going to be more time to talk about me. And he lays out a map of the world on the ground. And he says, Todd, pick a country. We're going to pray for it. Well, I start to freak out because I've never prayed out loud, especially for the nations. So I say, I'll pray for America. He says, pick somewhere further away. So I say, Canada. He says, no, 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 pick somewhere really far away. So the, the largest country that caught my attention in the middle of the map was Saudi Arabia. So I begin to pray for Saudi Arabia. He tells me, hey, come back next week. Tell me how many Muslims, how many mosques, how many Christians, how many churches are in Saudi Arabia. So I start to research this incredible country. I'm literally standing in line at Starbucks. Like I am four deep in line at Starbucks. And in front of me is a Muslim. I'm like, you're real. Oh, my gosh. I thought you were geography. And, and I go and I buy a book on how to reach Muslims. I then continue to pray for the world. I then take a short-term trip to the Middle East. And all of a sudden, over the, the, ne the, the, the next 15 months, something happens. Over the next 15 months, my me-centered, high-maintenance, self-absorbed purpose started to gravitate towards God's eternal, global, and unfulfilled purpose. Like literally, my high-maintenance, me-centered, self-absorbed Life purpose began to gravitate to God's global, eternal, and unfulfilled purpose. If you miss the purpose of God, you miss how to live, you miss how to give, and you miss how to raise your kids. If you miss the purpose of God, you miss how to live, you miss how to give, and you miss how to raise your kids. What is God's purpose? It's not hidden in the back. It's clearly seen off every page of Scripture. What is God's purpose? Here it is. His glory praised through Jesus among the nations. That's the succinctest way you could share his purpose. His glory praised through Jesus among his glory praised through his glory praised through Jesus among the nations. And the world has one goal. The world wants to drown out the purpose of God. That's what the world wants to do. The world has one goal, and it's to drown out the purpose of God. Now, if you had no knowledge of the Bible, and you picked one up and began to read it, the first 11 pages is just the introduction. It's just the introduction. And you can reduce the first 11 pages to four words. The first 11 pages from Genesis 1 through 11, you can reduce to four words. Creation, fall, flood, nations. That's the first 11 chapters of the Bible. Creation, fall, flood, nations. And you get to the end of the introduction in Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to pick up there where we get this word nations. Here it is. Genesis 1, or Genesis 11, 1 through 4. Now the whole earth had one language and a common speech. No matter where you went on planet earth, there was only one language, English. And as men moved eastward, they found a, a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. They said, come. Let us build for ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. God's told them to fill the earth, fill the earth, fill the earth. And look at what they said. They say, no, we want to make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Keep reading. What happens? Judgment comes. Verse 7, come, let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. 
So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth, and they stopped building the city. We go from one language in Genesis 11 to 70 languages created. 70 languages are created in Genesis 11. Today on planet Earth, there's 7,150. We've grown. Now, if you had no knowledge of the Bible and you get to Genesis 11, you should have anxiety in your heart. Like, what is God going to do? How is he going to reach these nations? How is he going to regather these 70 nations back under his glory? What is he going to do? And all you have to do to relieve that anxiety is turn the page. Turn the page to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12 is God's response. The Lord said, Abram, we know him as Abraham, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great. You're going to be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whoever curses you, I will curse. But Abram, here it is. The reason I am choosing you is not for you. It's so that the 69 other nations will respond. God says, I'm going to pick a nation that will bless all nations. Abram, will you respond? Think about this. As I've studied this passage, I, I, I call it the Abrahamic revolution. Because the mission of God becomes clear in Genesis 12. In Genesis 12, the mission and purpose of God becomes clear. Where he's going to use one man, create a nation to bless all nations. Think about it. The, I call it the Abrahamic revolution because what begins in Abraham comes to us. It goes from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Joshua to David to the prophets to Jesus to the early church to us. The leading scholar of all Christians in Europe who died a few years ago, John Stott, before he died, someone asked him this question. What's the most important passage in the Bible? He said, that's easy, Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Literally, the rest of Scripture is Genesis 12 on repeat. The mission of God takes shape in Genesis 12. And watch how Abram responds. Abram left as the Lord told him. Abram left as the Lord told him. God's going to repeat this command three times to Abraham, once to Abraham's son Isaac, and once to Isaac's son Jacob. You're going to hear it five times before you leave Genesis. Five times you're going to hear God's desire to see every tribe, tongue, people, and nation come to know him before you leave Genesis. We saw the first time it was spoken to, to Abraham in Genesis 12. Here's the second time, Genesis 18, 18. Abraham will become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations on the earth will be blessed in him. That's the second time. Here's the third time, Genesis 22, 18. In your offspring, Abraham, all nations on earth will be blessed. Now to Abraham's son Isaac. Genesis 26, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and give them all these lands and through your offspring all nations on earth will be blessed. And now to Isaac's son Jacob for the fifth time, promise is clear. Genesis 28, your descendants Jacob will be like the dust of the earth, but you will spread out to the west, to the east, to the north, to the south. Why? I'm about reaching all peoples. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. I live in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Behind our house, we have like three acres of forest, woods. My kids are always back there digging. They take my good spoons. They take my good spoons and they go back there and dig. Now, normally when they come back, they bring dead bugs and old Coke bottles. But recently, my daughter runs in. Dad! 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 I'm like, what's up, sweetie? She's like, I just found an ancient Indian arrowhead. I'm like, let me see. And she, I'm like, wow, that is that is an ancient Indian arrowhead. And she says, I got to clean it. Literally, I'm in the kitchen serving my wife like a good homeschool dad. And my daughter, she gets in the sink. Like she puts her feet in the sink. She plugs the sink. She turns the water on in the sink. She grabs the Clorox, the magic eraser, her brother's toothbrush. And she starts cleaning this ancient Indian arrowhead. A half hour later, a half hour later, I'm in the kitchen and all I hear is this. Are you kidding me? I go, Camden, what happened? She said, Dad, this isn't an ancient Indian arrowhead. It's a rock. She says, I've been, I've been cleaning a rock for 30 minutes. I thought, oh, good homeschool moment for a 15-year-old. I walk over to her. I say this, Camden, look at me. Look at me. The world offers you a rock to polish. God wants to give you a purpose to pursue. 
the world offers you a rock to polish. My daughter spent 30 minutes polishing a rock. Some of us in this room are going to spend 30 years trying to polish a savings, a portfolio, a job, giving our life to things that aren't about the purpose of God. And God invites us into his eternal, unfulfilled purpose of his glory praised through Jesus among the nations. And how do we respond? Over and over again, the rest of the Old Testament is just fulfilling this promise. Why did God raise up Egypt and, and pull Israel out of Egypt into the promised land? Listen to what he says through Moses to Pharaoh, Exodus 9. I have raised you up for this purpose, Pharaoh, that I might show you my power and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. That's what I'm about. I love Israel. I love Egypt. I love the world. Why does God give the Ten Commandments and the laws to this nation of Israel? So that they could love him and put him on display among the nations. Listen to what Moses says about the law in Deuteronomy. I have taught you these decrees and laws as the Lord my God commanded me. Observe them carefully, for this will show your wisdom and understanding to the nations. Who will hear about these decrees and say, surely this is a great nation and a wise and understanding people. Psalms. 175 times in Psalms, God mentions his heart for the world. 175 times. Let's just take one, Psalm 67. Psalm 67, I mean, 11 times in seven verses, God's going to repeat Genesis 12. 11 times he's going to mention his glory to the ends of the earth among all peoples. Listen to the passage. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine upon us, that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all nations. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. May the nations be glad and sing for joy. If you rule the peoples justly and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, O God. May all the peoples praise you. God blesses us. Why? Why does he give us influence and affluence? Is it for me? He tells us. God blesses us that all the ends of the earth may fear him. I had a picture that needed to be framed, so I took it to a picture frame shop. We, there are those. And, and, and I go into the picture frame shop, okay? And um, uh, I walk in. I have a picture I need framed. And I walk into the picture frame shop. I'm literally walking to the cash register, and I look on the wall, and I see a picture for sale. Now, ironically, this had a verse on it, and it had my favorite Old Testament verse, Psalm 4610, it had it right there. I love it. I went over to the picture on the wall, still having my picture in hand. I walk over to the picture on the wall, and it says, Psalm 4610, be still and know that I am God, dot, dot, dot. And I thought, oh my gosh, I love that verse. Now add to it, add to it, the picture had a deer, a tackle box, a fisherman, sun rising, gold calligraphy, a river, and I thought, oh my gosh, I heart this picture. I'd seen, I'd seen this verse, right? It was my favorite Old Testament verse, but I'd never realized the dot, dot, dot. Now, what does the dot, dot, dot mean? The dot, dot, dot means, hey, there's a second half, but we didn't think it applied to you. We didn't want to bore you, and we didn't want to crowd the picture. So we took the second half out and put dot, dot, dot. Man, how bad is the second half of Psalm 4610 that it doesn't make the journals, the mugs, or the screensavers? Like, how bad is the second half of Psalm 4610? What does it say? Be still and know that I am God and don't eat bacon? I mean, how bad is the second half that I've just never heard it? I've heard be still and know that I am God. I have no idea what the second half of Psalm 4610 says. So I pull out my, Bible, my app on my phone with the Bible. I go into Psalms. I type in Psalm 4610, and I read the whole verse because I wanted to find out how bad the second half was. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. That's the whole verse. But as a white, wealthy Westerner who wants the blessing of salvation and not the responsibility of taking it to the nations, how can I cut out my responsibility? How can I act like it's not there? 
dot, dot, dot. Not my problem. Missions isn't for me. Someone else will go. Someone else will care. Someone else will help. I've got two kids, a mortgage, and a truck. Like, I just can't. Like, no thanks. And watch what happens. We highlight and memorize the blessings for us. God's heart for the nations, we just say, that's not on me, Lord. That's on someone else's. All throughout Scripture, why does God give Solomon wisdom? 1 Kings 18, it's just Genesis 12 on repeat. King Solomon was greater in riches and wisdom than all the other kings of the earth. The whole world sought audience with Solomon to hear the wisdom God put in his heart. Over and over and over again, you almost go into a verse coma. It's so many times. Listen to a few more. Jeremiah 16, 19. O Lord, my strength, my fortress in time of distress, to you the nations will come from the ends of the earth and say our fathers possess nothing but false gods, worthless idols that did them no good. Habakkuk 2, 14. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. The Lord will be awesome to them. Zephaniah 2, 11. The, the Lord will be awesome to them when he destroys the gods of the land. The nations on every shore will worship him. Everyone in its own land. Malachi 1, 11, My name will be great among the nations from the rising and the setting of the sun. In every place, incense and pure offerings are brought to my name. Are you joking? It's over and over and over again. Yet I meet Christ followers who think having a heart for missions is optional. I meet Christ followers who are like, oh, that's just not me. I'm like, if you're a believer, welcome to the family. That's what we're about. When you look at the Old Testament of how God blessed Israel, it's flooring how much he gave them. He gave them the land. He gave them offspring. He gave them wealth. He gave them the temple. He gave them the tabernacle. He gave them the Sabbath. He gave them the Psalms. He gave them the priests, the prophets. He gave them everything under the Godhead so that they were able to pass on the blessings to the nations. And how does the end of the Old Testament summarize how they responded? Ezekiel 36, wherever they went among the nations, they profaned my holy name. Aren't you the Lord's people? Yes, we are. Yet they had to leave his land. I had concern for my holy name, which the house of Israel profaned among the nations. The more Israel was blessed, the more disobedient they became. And you know who does the same thing? Me. There's a tug of war every day. Every day I say four words. I dare not say them out loud. I say them in my heart. I say four words every day. I don't want to, but I do. I do. I'm sorry, but I do. Four words. The first word that I say happens before my feet hit the floor in the morning. Like, I wake up in the morning, I grab my phone from the nightstand, I go into an app that's linked to my savings account, and the first word my heart says in the morning is savings. And I go into my savings account, and I look at it. I don't know, maybe I thought someone was going to steal it. And I look at it, and I say the same thing every morning. Grow. Grow, little guy. Grow. Grow. I go downstairs, I make a cup of coffee, I, I hug my daughter, I hug my son, I hug my other son, I hug my other son, I hug my other daughter, I hug my other son, and I grab all six of my kids, and I say the second word of the day, not out loud in my heart, safety, safety, keep them safe. Then I go to work, and I say the third word of the day, resume, make me famous, Make me more important than every friend I know. Then I come home and I say the fourth word of the day, relax, you deserve it. This is your time now. Kick your feet up, Netflix binge. Savings, safety, resume, relax. And pretty much every Christ follower that you know revolved their lives around those four words. Ask any of your Christian friends, what do they think about? What do they long for? What do they want? What's their desires? What's their plan? What are they doing things for? And it'll come back to those four words. It'll come back to those four words. And then God invites me into his global, eternal, and unfulfilled purpose, and I respond by saying, does it affect any of those four words? Like, it can't affect those four words. And he responds by saying, oh, yes, it does then I just say, oh, well, have me excuse, Lord. This isn't the right age or stage. In the next age or stage, 
course, you know who says that? Everybody in every age and in every stage. When you transition to the New Testament, you see the Messiah. He comes, he lives, he dies, he resurrects. And he looks at how are we going to reach the nations. And he creates this mechanism called the church. He creates the church. Here's what he says in Matthew 16, 18. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. His plan where Israel fails, the church succeeds. His plan is where Israel fails, the church succeeds. I had no idea of this thing called the Great Commission. I got the Great Commission and the Great Commandment completely confused, and it turns out I'm not alone. 70% of all Christians have no clue what the Great Commission is. I hadn't either. I didn't realize there was five Great Commission texts. I thought there was like maybe one at the end of Jesus' life. If you're bored, you should do it. I had no idea there were five, and it was our marching orders. The first Great Commission text is the most familiar of the Great Commission text. It's found in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. It's not optional. It's not not the great suggestion. It's the Great Commission. If you're a believer, you should be about this. We should be baptizing people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. You should be teaching them to observe all that he's commanded. And you should know that as you do this, he's with you always. I love this Great Commission passage. There's four alls. All nations, that's the scope. All authority, he commands it. All that, I've, all that I've taught you, teach others. And I'll be with you always. This is the first Great Commission text. It's not the only Great Commission text. There's five. The second Great Commission text is in Mark 16, 15. A little different than Matthew 28. Shorter, it's gonna have be punchier. He's gonna say this. Go into all the world... And preach the good news to all creation. Again, scope, global. We are to be people who speak. The first two great commissions, they tell us we are to be goers who speak about Jesus to all nations. The third great commission text is Luke 24, 46, and 47. He said to them, this is written. This is not new. Genesis 12. This shouldn't be new. Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations. He says, Christ, that's who I am, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. That's what I did. Repentance, that's how you should respond. Forgiveness of sins, that's the benefit of responding appropriately. And the scope, we should all be thinking to all nations. The fourth Great Commission text, John 20, 21. John 20, 21. Peace be with you as the Father has sent me, so send I you. What does this mean for you and I? It means that if you're a Christ follower, the question is not, am I sent? The question is, to where? We're all sent ones. Now, you might go farther than me. You might go to Indiana. I might go to India. You might go geographically farther than me, but we're all sent ones. Matthew 28, Mark 16, 15, Luke 24, John 20, 21. The final Great Commission text is Acts 1, 8. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Why five? Why five? One would have done the trick, but he gives me five? Why five? Because there's a little bit of Israel in us all. God knows that when we get that blessing... Saving, safety, resume, relax, it's going to be all about us. He knows there's a little bit of Israel in us all. Why five? Let me share with you this. The people who heard these five commissionings, the last words of Jesus, seared their soul. This is their marching orders. Yet ironically, all of them, who many of them wrote our New Testament... Not one time do they ever quote any of the great commissionings in their writings after Acts 2. So Peter doesn't sit down in 1 Peter and say, Hey, church, remember what Jesus said on that mountain, Matthew 28. All authorities, he doesn't quote the great commission. John, in 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and, 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 and they don't quote. He doesn't quote this. James doesn't quote it. Jude doesn't quote it. Paul doesn't quote it. And I'm asking myself, man, why don't they quote these passages that were the last words of Christ that are our marching orders. And then I realized, oh my goodness, for the disciples, 
the mission of God didn't begin in Matthew 28. It didn't begin with Jesus. Jesus didn't give the Great Commission. He repeated it. For the New Testament authors, they were anchored in Genesis 12. And when you read the New Testament and you ask the question, where is the mission of God? It's Genesis 12 over and over again. Listen to this one. They quote Genesis 12 over and over. Acts 3.25, right after Pentecost. You are heirs of the prophets and the covenant God made with your fathers. And he said to Abram, through your offspring, all peoples on earth will be blessed. They quote Genesis 12. They saw Genesis 12 as the beginning of the mission of God in Abraham. Hebrews 6, when God made his promise to Abraham, he swore. What did he say? I will bless you and give you many descendants. He quotes Genesis 12. When Paul's writing to the Galatian church, talking about their mission, he doesn't quote Matthew 28, Mark 16, John 20, 21, or Luke 24. He doesn't quote it. He quotes Genesis 12. Galatians 3, the scriptures foresaw that God would justify the nations. He announced this gospel in advance to Abraham, and then he quotes Genesis 12. And in case you missed it, he comes back in verse 13. Scriptures foresaw that God would justify the nations. He announced this in advance. He redeemed us, verse 14. He redeemed us in order that the blessings given to Abraham might come to the nations. He quotes Genesis 12. Genesis 12. I have the privilege of doing a one-week intensive class in New York at a Christian college. I go there every March. They give me like 300 students. I go into the room. I mean, they're all sophomores. Stadium seating, so fun. Put on my mic, and I get like five days with these sophomores. So one of the things that we were discussing, we were talking about why there's so few missionaries in the unreached areas. And I had a marker board behind me And I just told them, I said, hey, shout out why there's so few missionaries in the unreached, and I'm going to put it on the marker board what you said. Oh, my gosh. We had so many. I mean, I'm not called. Apathy, indifference, debt, support raising. I mean, I had to slow them down. I'm like, guys, hang on, you know. Uh, information, the, it, it's scary, the need's here, government crackdown, you know. Oh, my gosh. And literally, like, literally, the board was filled. I'm transitioning on to something else. I go over to the notes, and I look up, and on the very top row, there's a, a hand raised. You got one? Yeah, I got one. You got a reason why there's so few workers in the unreached? I got one. And it's not on the board? I don't see it on the board. What he said next shocked me. What he said next stunned the room. What he said next, no one moved for a minute pondering what he said. I will never forget what he said. I said, go ahead. You got one? My Christian parents never presented being a missionary to the unreached as a career opportunity. They pointed me to medicine, to law, to engineering, and counseling. But not one time growing up did my parents pull me aside and say, you would make a fantastic missionary to the unreached. We want to see to it that you get there. What countries... Are you praying for your kids to be missionaries too? What countries? I mean, you're a Christ follower. They're a gift. God calls kids an arrow. Arrows are meant to fly. What countries are you praying for your kids and grandkids to go to? And if you look at me and say, oh, I'm not, then shame on you. Shame on you. You think God gave you these kids for your own personal enjoyment? 
No. They are incredible Christ followers that want to be used to reach the world. How are we doing that? I'm not clicking my heels together when my daughter wants to go to Iraq. That's going to be a hard day. But a harder day for me is when she spirals downward in self-absorption, marries the wrong guy, and forgets God. That's going to be a harder day. All throughout Scripture, God is challenging us. His glory praised through Jesus among the nations. He gives us influence and affluence, incredible giftings that we have to use them. And how are we doing? How are we doing? The conclusion the conclusion is found in Revelation 5, 9. Revelation 5, 9. And they sang a song, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe, every language, every people, and every nation. What God began in Genesis 12, you see it all throughout Scripture, and the culmination is Revelation 5, 9, where it works. The question is, are you part of the solution or are you part of the problem? That's the question. And I hope that you have some questions in your heart, like, well, how do I start? What do I do? What does that mean for me? Like, I've got crazy stuff going on. And at 12 o'clock in the multi-purpose room downstairs, we're gonna have a, a, a two-part session on what is your role in the Great Commission. We're gonna look at how you can play a part. So I know you got a lot going on, but at 12 o'clock, meander down there and come and hear more about your specific role. You won't be disappointed. When you came in, you got this card. If you didn't, go check it out on the way out. There's just five or six questions on there. Fill it out. Put your name. Put your info. We want to find you and get to know you so that's just not a Sunday morning thing. But we can plug you in and say, hey, here's how you can pray and mobilize and give and send and welcome. So take some time uh, before you head out of that lobby and fill this out. Imagine when you walk into a room, you notice who's there. Oh, man, he's here. Oh, man, he wore that yesterday. Um, if you walked into that Revelation 5 moment where every tribe, tongue, and nation is worshiping, if you walked into it right now, you would see 7,000 people groups making up 3.2 billion people who aren't in that room who are still waiting. My wife wanted to adopt. I told her I love dogs. She said, no, a kid. I was like, wait a second, that's next level. And I said to her, I said, Jess, we have five kids. When we go to Chick-fil-A, I order off the catering menu, okay? Like, it's a $72 deal, like, okay? I said, I said, we have a basketball team, okay? I don't need more kids. And she looked at me and said, every basketball team needs a sub. And so I'm like, okay, you're right, you know. So we decided we were going to adopt, and we decided that we were going to adopt from China. And so we got matched by uh, uh, an agency with a five-year-old son. And so, so we're on our way to we're on our way to China. But I say, hey, we got to take a vacation just before crazy gets here, you know. We got to take a vacation. So we're a homeschool family that loves Jesus. Where do we go on vacation? The Ark. They found it. It's in Kentucky. They were way off looking for it in Sinai. Who were they? We go to the ark, okay? And like, it's awesome. We love it. We're walking around. I'm feeling inspired. I'm like, oh my gosh, they had a gift shop. Like, I had no idea. But then you think about it, they had to make money on the ark, so a gift shop. So um, we literally, we, we're staying at a hotel by the ark, and my wife and the five kids are up in the room. I'm downstairs having coffee for breakfast, and the waitress comes over, and she starts talking to me. She's like, where are you guys going? I was like, oh, my gosh, we're on our way to China. She's like, oh, my gosh, why? And I'm like, oh, we're adopting. And this woman who's refilling my coffee, she asked me a question that floored me. She asked me a question that I had not been asked. She asked me a question that I didn't even know how to answer. I had to have her repeat the question. As she's refilling my coffee, she looks at me and says this. Does he know you're coming for him? I said, excuse me? She says, this boy in China, does he know you're coming for him? I said, ma'am, he has no idea. 
He has no idea that I've spent 15 months in FBI background checks, tax forms, that we've spent $45,000. He has no idea that in, in 21 days he's going to be stamped a new citizen of this magnificent country and be afforded every right and privilege this great country allows. He has no idea he has five siblings desperately ready to love him. He has no idea he has a college fund right now in his name. He has no idea he has a father. But I'm coming for him. I'm coming for him. And we talk about the second coming of Christ, but half the world's never heard of the first. And when you live your life for his purpose, his glory praised through Jesus among the nations, you're literally telling the unreached, we're coming for you. Thank you.